Well, how about it this morning, church? It's good to be in God's house this morning and worship Him. Amen? Let me, uh, let me invite our kids to head toward kids' worship. Uh, our kindergarten through fifth graders, if you guys would like to go for the kids' message, you are welcome to do that every week. Uh, at this time, your leaders are over here on this side, and uh, if you guys want to head toward the kids' room, we would love for you to be a part of that. If you're here for the first time and you have a kindergartner through fifth grader, and uh, maybe you can see it in their eyes, they're wanting to go, but they're a little bit scared too, uh, you're welcome to walk over with them and then come back and join us. Uh, we want them, to, want them to be a part of that if they want to. If you would, pull out your Bibles with me this morning and turn to the book of Ezra in the Old Testament. We are uh, in our third week in Ezra. We are in a series called The Gospel According to Ezra and Nehemiah, and we are going verse by verse through these books. In the Hebrew, in the original writing, these two books were together. They weren't separate. They go hand in hand. And it's a great story of God's promise. It's a great story of God's redemption. Um, we sang about it this morning. Aren't you uh, grateful this morning that we serve a God who cannot fail, uh, that we serve a God who keeps his promises? We serve a God who is holy and much different than we are. Uh, we serve a God who uh, is righteous and pure in every way. We serve a God who's real, and we have come to celebrate him this morning. Amen? Amen means we agree, and so sometimes we just yell amen in church, and we don't even know what that means, but it means we agree, and, uh, and that's what we do together as the body of Christ. And so let me bring you up to speed just real quickly. The last couple of weeks, we started off uh, here in Ezra, and we started in Ezra chapter 1, and Ezra chapter 1 was uh, a great scripture. I mean, it was, it was, it was incredible to see what God was doing here, it was a reminder of God's promise that God doesn't fail, that God doesn't lie, that God fulfills his promises. What had happened was the, uh, the, the people of God, Judah, uh, there was basically, there were 12 tribes of Israel. Two were in the south, uh, Judah and Benjamin. The rest, the other 10 were in the north. Well, the northern part had been conquered, and about 150 years later, the southern part, Judah and Benjamin, are conquered by the Babylonians. And it was because of their sin, God didn't protect them from the consequences. It was their fault. And so uh, the Babylonians take them over, and they take them into exile in Babylon. Uh, the scripture had, there was prophecy about it. We saw it from Jeremiah. We see it, uh, Daniel talked about it, that the exile would last for 70 years. And so that's exactly what happened. God delivered on that promise. After 70 years, God delivers them back from Babylon and calls up a remnant. There were about 3 million people, but God stirred the spirit of about 50,000 people, of God's people, and they return from Babylon, and they go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. They go back to rebuild the altar, and they go back to rebuild the temple, and eventually the city of Jerusalem and the walls around it. We'll see that later in Nehemiah. And it was, a, it was a great picture of God's promise and God's deliverance, how God had stirred the spirit of the people. And so you'll remember that two weeks ago, what we said, we kind of applied it to us, is that out of 3 million people, 50,000 went back. And we talked about how so many people in life are living still as prisoners to the world. They're living in Babylon when they need to get their tails over in Jerusalem and start living for the Lord. So that's kind of where we left off week one. And then we got to week two last week, and you guys will remember this was the genealogy. This was the like, do we really preach this passage? Ezra, just glance at it right quick if you weren't here. Look at Ezra chapter two. This is what you missed last week. We read off a list of names. It, there were 125 names or so, and it represented the 50,000 people right down to the... And it covered every detail. I mean, it even covered the, the last donkey and horse and everything else that was going back to Jerusalem for, for the rebuilding. And, and the key to this was as Ezra chapter 2, verse 1. It says that they returned to Jerusalem. It was God delivering on his promise. And so we get to Ezra chapter 3 this morning, and, and this, is where we, this is where we are. And I want to just say this starting off. I, I feel strongly in my heart, God, God, God showed me this this week, laid it on my heart. I think about my own life, and I think about 
every person that may be sitting here this morning. And I feel that there are probably a lot of people sitting here and you're dealing with some things from your past. You're dealing with some things that you're not sure that God really could forgive you. You're not sure that other people have really forgiven you. And you may be even struggling to forgive yourself. And you are living as a prisoner to your past and you're missing the present. And you're missing what God wants to do in your life for the future, for as long as he has you here on this earth. And so Ezra chapter 3 is going to teach us a great lesson about that. That's kind of where we'll end up this morning. I've entitled the message, Moving Forward, Don't Let Your Past Define You. This passage is going to show us some very clear directives this morning about moving forward in our faith. In fact, if you go to the New Testament in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, there's a reminder. It's one of those classic verses of the faith. It says that in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. God designed our faith in Him to be forward-moving. He designed it to be... Uh, in an overarching way, uh, something where we realize that, yes, we understand and we remember the past, but the past doesn't define us. That we are saved from our sin, and God has a new day for believers. That, that we were old in one way, but we're made new in Christ. Before you were saved, you were, you were lost, but now you're found. Before you knew Christ, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But we are made what, church? We are made alive in Christ. We've been redeemed. We've, we've been washed and made clean by Christ. So faith is forward moving. And in an overarching way, we can learn a lot from this passage. There's some big important chunks in this passage. So we're going to read it a little bit at a time this morning rather than pulling off the whole thing at once. But by the, by the end of the sermon today... We will be about 2 o'clock this afternoon, I'm just kidding, about 12 o'clock. We'll be through with, uh, with chapter 3. So let's look at the first verse. Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. It says, When the seventh month came, and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. All right, we've got to stop right there. The people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. If there's a directive starting off that I see from this, a directive from God's Word that the church needs to hear this morning and that we need to be reminded of, is that we must seek unity. The people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Let me just remind you this morning, church, that unity is essential for God's people. If you're familiar with the history of Israel and the story of Israel that we're looking at here in Ezra, verse 1 is kind of a refreshing sound to God's people because at this time, God's people were often divided. They were often at odds with one another. I mentioned the ten tribes in the north and the two in the south. It was because there was division among God's people. But here in Ezra chapter 1, we see them now united as one man. And let me just say it, let me just say it straight up. Conflict is the way of the world, but it is not the way of God. Unity is not the way of culture, but unity should be the way of God's church. We are different now that we know Christ. The church should be different. Let me just say, and be, say it and just be straight up this morning. We all need people to be straight up with us sometimes, don't we? Like one person said, yes, we, all, we don't like it, but we all need people to be straight up with us sometimes, don't we? My beautiful wife, Sharon, who left me this weekend and went to the beach uh, over at Labor Day and left me with the kids, and it's been awesome. Um, it really has. And she has all of you hoodwinked. She's, the, she's probably watching this on the, on the live stream right now, and I'm going to be dead meat. But she, to, to you all, she is the sweet pastor's wife. But with me, let me just be honest, I'm a bonehead sometimes, and there are times that she gets straight up with me. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever had your spouse just get straight up with you and say, look, you need to straighten it out. And I don't always like it, but you know what? I need it. And sometimes we need just the straight talk. And I just want to bring some straight talk to the church. Disunity makes the church ineffective. Churches that cannot be unified need to repent before God. 
as we carry out the biblical function of the church, as we wait on the day, which is what we're supposed to be doing, that Jesus returns, we as God's church, and I'm not just talking Crosshaven here, but we as God's church need to be unified. Jesus said he would build the church, but in John 17, 11, he said he prayed that his church would be unified as he does it, as he builds the church. He will build and grow the church, but we must strive to remain as one man together. When we take unity lightly in the body of Christ, when churches argue over the color of the paint on the walls and carpet and silly stuff that a lot of churches do and become unfocused and take their, their hearts and minds off of Christ, it goes against the very grain of what Jesus desires for his bride to be. It goes against the very grain of it. In other words, here's the straight talk. There is no room in God's church for me, myself, and I. Jesus is the center of attention. Jesus takes center stage in the church. That's why the Apostle Paul constantly stressed that we have an obligation to one another. He did it in Romans. He did it in Ephesians. He, he constantly said we must remain unified and focused on the most important thing, that being Jesus Christ and Him being worshipped and Him being lifted up and Him being made known. That's the function of the church. So the first lesson that we see in forward-looking faith, in other words, the faith that moves forward, is that we seek unity. When God's people focus on Christ in unity... Man, God will work and we will be amazed at what God will do among us when His people are unified under the name of Jesus Christ and focused on Jesus Christ. Now secondly, forward-moving faith is always related to obedience. Look at verses 2 through 6 with me. Unity is important, but you can't move forward in faith without obedience. Faith and obedience come hand in hand. Look at verses 2 through 6. It says, Then arose Jeshua, the son of Josadak, with his fellow priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltil, with his kinsmen, and they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it's written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the land, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the Feast of Booths, as it's written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new moon and all the appointed feasts of the Lord and the offerings of everyone who made a freewill offering to the Lord. From the first day to the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. So here, here they were, and they were obedient to set back up the, the worship and the offerings that had to be done in the temple. One of the first things that we do is we, see, is we see the returning exiles, these people coming back from Babylon, back into Jerusalem. And the, the first thing that we see them doing is offering sacrifices to the Lord. The fear of God was upon them. They had been in exile because of their sin and because of their disregard toward God. But as they return, notice they're very, very careful to start offering sacrifices according to the way that the law had been commanded. Their time in exile, I'm sure, was a constant reminder of their idolatry and their rebellion that had brought God's judgment on them to start with. Now, you may say, well, that's cool. Well, how does that translate to us sitting here this morning on September the 4th, 2016 in Alabama? As we wait for God, and it's what we're supposed to be doing as believers, as we're waiting for God to renew all things and bring about our full redemption, we are still living in a world that's full of sin, aren't we? The temptation for us to disobey, disobey and not do what God desires for us to do still remains, doesn't it? Every day. And the ability and the reality that we fail is very much at play in our lives every day. But because we are saved... If you know Christ this morning, if you're sitting in this room, if you are saved, if you're redeemed by God, if you're a child of God, obedience should be at the forefront. Obedience should be the response that you seek to give God because He has saved you. 
Out of thankfulness, you should long to be obedient to Christ. Because He saved you. Obedience is not what saved you. You can't get saved by obedience. If, but if you are saved, then growing obedience is proof that it's real and shows that you're thankful for what Christ has done for you. Does that make sense? So forward moving faith means that you become more and more obedient to Christ. Now the third thing that we learn from this passage is that forward moving faith means that God, that His work becomes our most important work in life. So unity is important, so obedience is important, but it also, forward moving faith means that doing the things of the Lord, that doing God's work becomes the most important work in our life. Doing things for God, working to advance His kingdom, wherever He places us in life, family, job, community, making Christ known is our priority. So the third thing that we see is that we must work to advance God's kingdom. Look at verses 6 through 11. The scripture says, as we finish up verse 6, we hit the first part of it. I'll go back to the beginning of verse 6. It says, From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, the king of Russia. Now in the second year after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltil, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua, with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons and the sons of Judah together, they supervised the workmen in the house of God along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of, king, of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. And listen to this. They said, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted, with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Some of the most powerful scripture you'll find in the Old Testament. It is just a reminder this morning that we must work to advance God's kingdom, that God's work is the most important work in our lives. It's not that, it's not that we can save anyone. God does the saving, doesn't he? But he clearly, clearly, you see it through Scripture, he clearly uses us, his people, to make himself known. He doesn't have to do that. He chooses to use his people. It's a place of privilege. If you're a believer, the things you get to do for God, those things are a privilege. They're not a task. They're not a, they're, they're not a burden. Getting to serve God is a, is a privilege. At, at this point in the Scripture, here in chapter 3, I want you to notice that the altar for sacrifices had been built by this point. They, they build the altar first, but God's temple still remained in ruins. So in this, these verses, we see that they labored with joy and they celebrated then, after they had built the altar, to lay the foundation. This was one more step in reclaiming their identity as God's people. They laid the foundation. They went to work to build the temple to advance God's kingdom. It's just a reminder to me this morning, and I want to remind you that the church, God's church, listen to me real close, God's church is not for our entertainment. It is not for us to come and sit and soak and never serve. The modern American church, let me just be straight, let me straight talk again. The modern American church has a problem with it. This problem is that in America we have created a church with a spectator atmosphere. The Ameri I'll do it. We have created a church with a spectator atmosphere. The American church looks much, much different than it does in many parts of the world. And unfortunately, very much, get this, very much unlike what the Bible tells us the church is supposed to look like in many cases. Church 
Church, church, people, church is not a spectator thing. Church is not a show. Church is not an activity. It's not a part of our weekly calendar. It's not something we put on our list of things to do. The church is the people who have been redeemed by Christ, the people who know Christ, and because we've been redeemed by Christ, we are now to walk in obedience and we have work to do. And why do we have work to do? Because there are people all around us who do not know Jesus Christ. People need to hear the gospel. The word of God needs to be preached and taught very clearly as it is. People need to hear the gospel. The word needs to be preached and taught. People need counseling and physical needs remain in our community. We, we must continue in the Lord's work to advance God's kingdom. Charles Spurgeon said, It is our duty and our privilege to exhaust our lives for Jesus Christ. God has given us much to do and God's given us much to build. We can't just build the altar and then just stand there and look at how nice it is. We have to get to building the foundation so that we can get to building the temple. We must make working for God a priority in our lives. Making God's kingdom our first work. That's exemplary of forward-moving faith. And fourth, and here's where we're going to camp out the most today, verses 12 through 13. Forward-looking faith means that you don't let your past dictate you. And I, don't, I want to say this straight up. I'm not saying the past is not important. That's not what I'm saying at all. We learn a lot from the past, don't we? We learn a lot from history. We learn a lot about what to do and what not to do, don't we? But I want you to see in verses 12 and 13 that forward-looking faith means that you don't let the past dictate you. Look at chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. The Scripture says in verse 12, it says, all right, and remember what's happened. They're, they, they're building the foundation. And remember what I just read? It says that they began to shout with praises. They said, for he's good. His steadfast love endures forever. They shouted with a great shout in verse 11 when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But look at verse 12. It says, but many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house. These are people, let me explain this. These are people that had been in Jerusalem before and they, they had taken part in worship at Solomon's temple and they knew what the old temple was like but now they had gone to exile in Babylon and they're old enough to have lived through the exile and to come back and now they're seeing the new temple being built. It says that these old men who had seen the first house as the new one's being built, the foundation's being laid, get this, this is so interesting, it says they wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid though many shouted aloud for joy. And verse 13 says, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping, for the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Pretty interesting scripture. Let's go into this. We're going to camp out here longer than the rest of it. Forward-looking faith means that you don't let the past dictate you. The past may teach you. The past may help you see what is good and what is bad. But the past cannot consume your present and your future. You see, Christ needs to consume our present and our future. So many people live defeated in the disappointments of yesterday. And other people live thinking that the here and now and the future could never be as good as things used to be in the past. It's like two opposite problems, but equally wrong in, in, in viewing how to do things. So I would say the fourth thing that we see here about forward-moving faith is that we must not let disappointment from the past make us ineffective now. And we must not let, let discontentment about our lives now keep us from living for Christ and seeing how Christ is at work today and tomorrow and until the time he comes back and takes us home. So let me, you may be saying, okay, well, so what's the point? Let me kind of make it concise. We must learn to endure discontentment and disappointment and not let the past guide us and, or, or not let the past define who we become. And there's a great picture of it here in these verses. Even though God's, here, here it is, even though God's people were unified as they're back in Jerusalem, we saw that in verse 1, and, and even though they're bringing sacrifices and they're making worship a priority, and even though they're restoring the temple, there's a little hiccup here. 
Some of the elders who were old enough to remember the first temple and all of its glory, some of the leaders and the priests who had lived in Jerusalem before the exile, the ones who had worshipped at Solomon's temple, here's, here's what it boiled down to. They were disappointed in the foundation of the new temple. They looked at the foundation and they were disappointed. They saw the foundation and they realized that this temple wasn't going to be like the old one was. It's kind of odd that the younger Jews that were present that day, the ones who had been born in Babylon, they had never seen the old temple. They had never seen Solomon's temple. And so for them, it was a time of great joy. But the, and the Bible says they shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord. But the others who were there that day, the elders who remembered the old temple, they could not shout about what they were seeing. Instead, the Bible says they wept with a loud voice. I mean, it's a weird happening in the middle of something that seemed like it was good. The young men shouted with joy while the old men wept. And I want us to just camp out there for a minute. What are we seeing here? What, do, what does it mean? We're seeing some folks who were disappointed and discontent with what God was doing. Are y'all hearing that? There were some folks discontent with what God was doing. It seems crazy that people could be discontent and disappointed in what God is doing, isn't it? Doesn't that seem, y'all talk to me, isn't that crazy? Doesn't it seem crazy that people could be discontent and disappointed in God? Discontent and disappointed in what God is doing, but it happens all the time. In this case, their past was dictating them. They were missing what God was doing now. That's why I named the sermon what I named it, Moving Forward, Don't Let the Past Define You. What they were hung up on was keeping them from celebrating what God was doing. How many things in our lives do we have that we're hung up on that make us miss what God's doing right now? So let's talk about what they remembered for remember. They remembered the grandeur and the glory of the old temple. They remembered the good old days when the temple of the Lord was one of the wonders of the ancient world. They remembered a temple that if it was built today would cost multiple billions of dollars. They remembered a temple that had the Ark of the Covenant in it and the mercy seat. They remembered... That, that within the Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments that were given from Moses, the law that had been handed down to them from Moses. They remembered the Shekinah glory cloud that filled the first temple. In Second Chronicles 5.14, it talked about that. It said, at one time this temple, the temple they're remembering, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house. I mean, what an incredible sight. I mean, what if the glory of the Lord filled the church so much that the preacher didn't have to preach? Y'all would love that, wouldn't you? I mean, but that's what they were remembering. An incredible thought. They remembered a day when Solomon's temple was literally the house of God and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And maybe they thought, it, maybe they were sitting there that day and they saw the new foundation. They thought it can never be that way again. But they weren't looking at God. They were underestimating God. And that leads to a second thought. They thought about, I mean, think about what they realized. They, they understood at that very moment, they're seeing that this foundation is smaller. It's never going to have the, the things the other one had. They realized it would never be the same as the old one. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Who's left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Maybe... Maybe they were focused on the wrong things. Maybe they were focused on the physical size of it. They could see by the size of the foundation that the new temple was going to be smaller. They knew that they didn't have the resources to rebuild it like it was years ago. They realized that all the things that made the first temple precious, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the glory cloud, that those were forever gone. And this realization obviously broke their hearts, and it says they wept. They wept bitterly. And, and I get it. We can all look back, probably, and talk about when we grew up, can't we? Those were the good days. There's some of y'all in here, and you're looking, you know, some of y'all are, some, man, some of y'all are, some of y'all are getting close, buddy. I'm just kidding, but you're, you remember back in the day, and, you know, some of you are thinking of the 50s, and you're like, man, I remember when rock and roll was invented, and some of you are in the 60s and it was the Beatles and the Beach Boys and you're like, boy, if it could just be back like it was then. You don't understand anything that the millennials are doing and you're like, who are those freakos? You know, or you're in the 70s and everything's just groovy. You don't remember half of it, but 
And then there's the 80s, and, you know, everything was bad to the bone and thriller, man. I mean, I get it. We think our time was the best time, and, and, and I'll be honest with you. Let me just be, let me, let me straight talk again. I mean, going back wouldn't be all that bad in some ways. There was a time, listen to me, when our country was more stable. There, there was a time when things made more sense. There was a time when the Word of God and the house of God were held in higher regard in our country. There was a time when the fear of God was on communities and even on people who were lost. Even many who didn't believe in Christ at least respected the things of God. And even within the church, there was a day when God's presence and God's power, were, there were some great times of revival in God's church, there was a time when God's presence and His power were manifested in the Lord's house and among God's people in a much more evident way than it's being manifested in the American church today. So in some ways, it's easy to see how these older Israelites could look back to the old temple and be disappointed and discontent with the beginnings of the new one. And in some ways, it's easy to look at the modern American church today with a broken heart and long for simpler church. Long for more powerful days to return to the pulpits of churches. It's easy for, 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 for us to, to look at that and, and say, we wish there was a more evident uh, following after the Holy Spirit of God in God's church and among God's people that impacted the community in a greater way instead of the culture impacting the church. It's easy to long for days when the church stood more against sin and more for God and more for people, but stood against sin and didn't bow down to culture and didn't try to blend with culture to make itself popular or make itself applicable. I get it. But let's also flip it around because God was working in the book of Ezra and God is working now. In verses 12 and 13, there were some folks that remembered the old temple and they realized the new temple was going to be smaller and not as grand and they saw that it wasn't going to have all the stuff that the old one had. But there were even more people who didn't remember the first temple at all. They had no idea that it, what it had looked like or the glory that it had been in it before. All they remembered, all they knew was a life of captivity in Babylon. They had been born in Babylon. That's all they ever knew. And now they knew that God was bringing them home to Jerusalem and they were getting to build something new. All they could remember was their slavery. And to them, at the front of their hearts and in their minds, was simply now how God and His power had delivered them from slavery into freedom. They were now free from exile because God had delivered them and they were thankful to be building the new temple. And that's why I want to say we shouldn't let our past dictate us. We should remember what God has done, but it shouldn't dictate us. We should remember that God has saved us out of exile and he has brought us into freedom. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, then we have a work to do. And we shouldn't be disappointed in God and we shouldn't think that God's not working. We should realize and we should join in his work. And the reason I want to say that is because I, the realization is that there are more churches in America that are dying than there are churches that are thriving. And it's easy to err on either side of this thing. I get it. Some people are so caught up in the past that they can't get excited about what God's doing in the present. And still there are others who are in, willing to embrace every newest trend and method and they've made church into a social club and they forget about the fact that God is the one who saves and God is the one who does and God is the one who is. Bottom line, the past is gone forever and we have no choice but to live in the present. We need to look back to the past and glean what we can, what's good and helpful, but we have to live in the here and now and we don't need to miss what God's doing now and what he, God will do in the future if we're obedient and faithful and focused on Him, on Jesus Christ. And these people were dealing with misplaced expectations, and maybe we need to learn to deal with that and disappointment. Anybody in here this morning, you're dealing with disappointment? And maybe you've got some misplaced expectations. You thought things would be different than they are with you sitting here this morning. Everyone knows disappointment sooner or later. Friends break their word. Marriages are not easy. Children move away and don't call enough. Colleagues betray us. The company lays us off. Doctors can't cure us. Investments disappear. Our dreams are shattered. The best laid plans go astray. Other Christians disappoint us. 
And very often we disappoint ourselves because we are all sinners falling short of the glory of God. We live in a world of disappointment because of our sin. And if we do not come to grips with this truth and start putting Christ at the center of our disappointments and problems, then we only spiral further and further away from seeing how God will work in our lives and where he will work and how he works. English author Joseph Addison got it right. He said, Our real blessings often appear to us in the shapes of pains, losses, and disappointments. How do you deal with it? The old men wept rather than realizing the significance of the deliverance from the exile and the reality of a new foundation that was being built. They were disappointed. They had misplaced expectations. It was said of Alexander the Great that he wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. John Quincy Adams, he was the sixth president of the United States. He wrote in his diary, My life has been spent in vain and idle aspirations. That was the sixth president of the United States. Joe Torre, who was a baseball player and former manager of the New York Yankees, once said that a little boy walked up and asked him, didn't you used to be somebody? And Abraham Lincoln, in talking about how it felt to lose the race for U.S. Senator to Stephen Douglas in 1858, said, I feel like the boy who stubbed his toe. I'm too big to cry and too badly hurt enough to laugh. We all make certain assumptions about life, about how we think it's going to be. Deep down, we believe if we do certain things, that other people are going to treat us a certain way. We assume that we've earned certain things out of life. If those expectations are not met, then we're disappointed, right? And maybe that's why so many people struggle. Maybe that's why there's such a correlation between good mental health and having assumptions that match reality. And there's a high correlation between misplaced assumptions and depression. Put simply, we're disappointed when things don't go the way we thought that they ought to go. Wrong expectations lead to disappointment. Disappointment leads to despair and depression. And people don't often let it push them toward Christ for help and answers, but they often let it push them away from Christ, the very thing that they need. And that's what happened with these older men here, and that's what's happening in our culture. Why were these elders disappointed? They remembered how good things used to be, and because they were living in the past with all its glory, they couldn't deal with the present reality and deal with what they were dealing with. And honestly, the way it boils down, I think God was orchestrating the whole thing. He was pushing them all closer to the ultimate solution, which would be Jesus Christ one day. This was before the time of Christ, and he was pushing the people, pushing the people toward Christ. God never changed. You know, we serve a God that never changes. But the time was drawing closer for the coming of Christ. The way, the way for them to know God was going to change. And it hadn't happened yet, as we're reading in Ezra. Sacrifices in the temple were still taking place, but they wouldn't be needed one day. The Ark of the Covenant would not be the way to be in God's presence anymore. So he was pushing them toward worshiping him in a deeper way. And maybe that's why the temple was going to look totally different. They didn't need the big building anymore. They built the altar first. Worshiping God came before building a building. It's a reminder. We can worship God anywhere. Tornado blows this away. The church can still meet. And they began the cleanup effort. They began to stand. Even though they faced enemies. And we'll see that later. So you put it all together and it looks like this. In spite of the rubble, in spite of the opposition, in spite of all that had happened to them in the past, the people of God banded together and they got to work. They raised money to buy cedar logs. They organized workers into teams. They pitched in. They went to work. They picked up the huge boulders. They, they brought them to where they had to be. They cut down the bushes. They dug up the weeds. They cleared out the broken timber, the jagged pieces of metal. Little by little, day by day, week by week, they begin to clean it out and they begin to build from what had been over a half century of neglect. It's a great lesson for the church today. They went to work. It's a great lesson for the church not to be a spectator church. It's an old adage, you can't stay in bed forever. Someone has to mop the floor, someone has to take out the trash. Someone has to open the office, someone has to turn on the lights. Someone has to pay the bill, someone has to fix the motor, someone has to enter the data. Someone has to make the sales presentation. Someone has to review the chart. Someone has to make the lessons plans. Someone has to see the patient. Someone has to grade the papers. They built the altar. They built the foundation. 
Now they had a temple to build. Don't let your discouragements from the past, don't let, you, don't let your past convince you that you can't be used by God. Don't let, don't let it discourage you. Don't let it dictate who you are. Let it shape who God wants to make you into. John Maxwell said, The smallest act of obedience is better than the greatest intention. He's right. Better to do a little for God than sit around about dreaming to do a lot. And we can't neglect to praise the Lord. They began to shout with great shouts of praise. We should sing praises for who God is and for what He's doing. That's why I love the three songs we sang this morning. He just talked about who God is and what God does. They... When the foundation was laid, they, they started to sing, He is good. They didn't sing, We are good. They didn't say, We did this with God's help. Even though that was kind of true. But they just gave God the glory. I'm struck by the fact that they didn't wait until the building was done to praise the Lord. I mean, years would actually pass before the temple was finished, but it's a lesson for us all. Here's what it boils down to. We can all look back to disappointments and we can look back to good things too. We can learn a lot from the past, but it should not dictate and shouldn't overcome the fact that we should be focused on the Lord today and He should be the focus of what we do tomorrow. The one thing that Jesus said, next Sunday we're going to take the Lord's Supper, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The one thing we should look back on is remember the cross. We should remember what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, that he shed his blood for our sin, for the, for the remission of our sin, that he, that he did that for us, that his body was broken for us. That's what should drive us. Jesus ought to be on our minds constantly. That's, that ought to be what we remember. If our worship band wants to come and lead us and we're going to close with one more song this morning, a song of invitation and a time just to invite you to come and pray and to talk with the Lord. If you need someone to talk to this morning, you're, you're more than welcome to come up here and, and share that with us. We're always here to pray for you and to, and to share with you and to talk with you. If you need someone, that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're here for. But more than anything, let's make sure that we're focused on the Lord, that that's, that's who we're worshiping this morning. And if you've got some things standing in the way, some things from the past, or maybe even things you're struggling in today, and it's standing in the way of your worship, then repent and give those things to the Lord. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, we always invite you. The, the, the invitation is given by God. Today is the day of salvation. Just, just come and say, look, I don't even know Jesus. Tell me, tell me how to be saved. I want to know him. The scripture says in Psalm chapter 20, it says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. Amen, church? He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some people, the scripture says, trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let's stand and worship, church.